Today we're going to continue where we kind of left off, uh, finding purpose in life or finding purpose in your life, because that's, that's the sole goal of all of us. We need to find purpose and understand that there is a purpose for you being here. You're not just made by chance. You're just not, you know, a glob that just came into this world and taken up and occupying space. But you are a special creation of God. And when you realize that God has created you, you begin to live a purposeful life. And to find your purpose in life is often easier than we think. If we view that God can use all of life's circumstances to accomplish His will, then what we must start doing is to live as if God is guiding us in all of our vocations. Wherever you are, you've got to realize God has placed you there either a short period of time or a long period of time. It matters not, but God has placed you there in order to prepare you, in order to allow you to accomplish something greater in life or to be used right there in the place place that he has planted you and you may not like what's happening in your life but you need to rest assured if you're living for God then he can use it for his good amen read Romans chapter 8 you begin to understand that all things got it all things well you know just a few things no all things work together for the glory of God and when we begin to realize that we have this understanding that God is using us where we are, planted for the short period of time. And Nehemiah, as we saw last week, and we'll continue looking at him today, Nehemiah was able to use his secular job, and I'm going to use that word, secular job, and, uh, you know, understand we've got secular jobs, and he used Nehemiah's secular job in order to open doors to accomplish his bigger Last week, I coined the phrase, God job. Remember that? Nehemiah was using his secular job as a way to accomplish what God was having a bigger God job for him. You've got a God job. God is wanting you to get involved and, and serve Him in some manner, some form, using your talents, bringing glory to God, bringing people to Jesus Christ. God is wanting you to use whatever and wherever you are in order for preparation to be used in your God job. And we must work our secular jobs in a way that brings glory to God. And I ask this morning to begin with, are you willing to let God work His plan in you? You've got to answer that. I answer it for myself. You answer it for yourself. You don't answer for somebody else. We like to. We like to say, well, they're not using their talents. Well, are you using your talents or are you somehow missing the point? So are you willing to let God work his plan in you? Now, Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning with verse 1 through 20. Last week we saw Nehemiah chapter uh, uh, 1. We looked at a couple of passages there. And Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning with verse 1 and going all the way through verse 20, we began to see the life of Nehemiah. Now, uh, let me just kind of give you a overview. Nehemiah has inquired about the situation of his homeland, Jerusalem. Now you gotta understand, Nehemiah was taken captive quite a while back. He, the, his people were allowed to leave and to go back to Jerusalem, to build it back, to reestablish it. Nehemiah chose to stay where he was at. See, sometimes God wants you to stay where you're at and God wants you to be used in a mighty way because he's preparing you for that God job he has down the road. And so Nehemiah, last week we saw how Nehemiah, he, 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 he inquires when a brethren comes and he, he asks them, well, what's going on with Jerusalem? And the guy says, oh, let me tell you how bad Jerusalem is. Jerusalem's in a mess. And Nehemiah was heartbroken. And when he was heartbroken, he begins to, to, to somehow have a countenance where he's fasting and he's praying. And we're going to see that again this morning. And he begins to inquire of God. God, you know, I, I, I'm just distraught. God, we have sinned against you. And God, I'm open to whatever you want me to do. And he begins to inquire. Now he's in the presence of the king. And he is the cupbearer to the king. And the king notices something. And the king says, Nehemiah, what's going on with you? He says, you've never looked like you look right now. And the king even identifies that there's something deep down inside of you. Your heart, 
your heart, there's something going on where you're burdened in this aspect. Now you can read this when you get a chance, verses 1 through 20, and you'll begin to see. And what Nehemiah begins to do, he says, you know, how can my heart not be torn and broken because my uh, heritage, my ancestor's land, is just, it's just torn down, it's distraught. There's no protection. Then he begins to inquire and uh, we'll begin to see the things that unravel here. So let me give you some questions. And in order for you to find your purpose in life, these are questions you need to consider. This is what we see in the life of Nehemiah. And I'll point out some of the verses as we're going through here. The first thing that we need to consider, the first thing you need to consider is have I dealt with my sin? That's the very first thing. From the very beginning, you need to deal with your sin. Now, last week we saw that. We saw how Nehemiah, he says, you know, Lord, uh, you know, we, the people have sinned, but he comes down to the very nitty gritty. In chapter one, if you want to refer to it, chapter one, verse six, he says, the latter part of verse six, he says, both I and my father's house have sinned. Now this is the recognition that we are sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, everybody is a sinner. All of us commit sin. I mean, if you look at what Jesus taught there on the Sermon on the Mount, that even if we are thinking it without acting on it, it is sin to us, okay? It is a violation of what we ought to be doing. We ought to be living for God. We ought not be living for our own whims and desires that we have. So have you dealt, the very first question you need to consider, have I dealt with my sin? That's it. Now, in order to find the purpose in life, the purpose in your life, you need to move from the area of dealing with your sin because if you don't deal with your sin, you're not gonna fulfill God's purpose for you. You're not gonna be able to accomplish what God knows only you can accomplish. I told you I'm not musically inclined. That's okay. My children are, Sandy's children are. Amen. I, I almost said that I married Sandy for her musical talents because I knew that I was going to be a preacher, but I didn't know I was going to be a preacher. But she had been playing in church for years before ever her and I got serious in the area of uh, marital relationship and, and so forth. And what I'm saying is God prepares us. God is using us. She didn't know she was going to be a pastor's wife, but God has used her and continues to use her to play the piano. Uh, I, I love there at the house hearing her play the piano. And, you know, she may not think I'm listening, but I do. Well, let's go into the area. So we, we deal with the sin. We move into this area. The second thing that we need to consider is, is my heart in it? Because people, let me tell you something. There there are a lot of people working jobs, secular jobs, and their heart's not in it. They're in it just for a what? A paycheck. And then they grumble about the paycheck they get. They think that you're jipping them, and in reality, they agreed what they was going to get paid before they came there. Amen, right? You got it? And when you get to this concept, we ought to be thankful. And, and if your heart's not in it, you say, well, you just don't know my boss. Well, people, let me tell you something. You don't know some of the bosses I worked for when we moved here to Georgia. I worked for some individuals that people in the community didn't want nothing to do with. But they opened the door to me and I lived a godly example to them that made a difference in their lives. So don't tell me about, well, you just, you just always had that perfect boss. God's your boss, and you know you, that's a perfect boss. No, I've been in the secular business. I, I understand this. And so it is your heart in it. It, it. Look at Nehemiah. His heart was aching. That's what we see there in verse 2 of chapter 2. Wherefore the king said unto him, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing, this is what the king recognizes, this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. You see, your heart's got to be in it. If you're, listen, if your heart's not in glorifying God, you're not going to glorify God. But if your heart is in glorifying God, you will glorify God. You've got to get your heart in the right manner. 
It isn't about, well, my head knowledge has got it, but my heart knowledge is not. No, people, listen to me. It's got to be the heart knowledge because the heart is what keeps every other part of your body alive. You remove your heart, you're dead. So your heart has got to be in that right area. So is my heart in it? That's the question you need to consider. Whatever you're doing, do as unto the Lord, the New Testament teaches us. And we go into the area of not only is my heart in it, is sec- uh, thirdly is do I care enough to see it through? How, how, I'm going to really put you on the spot here. How many of you have started jobs that you have not finished? You're guilty, right? You start some job, okay, and you don't totally finish it, all right? And and that's, you know, do you care enough to see it to its completion? Do you care enough to see it all the way through the end? Do you have the ability to discount the cost and get into that area of saying, whatever it costs, I will persevere, I will accomplish this. And so we come into that area of, do I care enough to see it through? And then when we get into the area of chapter uh, 2, verse 3, is there a concern? But now verse 3, and he said unto the king, this is what Nehemiah says, he says, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulcher lieth waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? This is where he is concerned. He's saying, you know, everybody there is vulnerable. They're under attack constantly. Now people, let me, let me bring it to this realm today. We live in a world that's under attack, amen? The devil is trying to attack. The walls are broken down. The church has allowed the walls to be broken. And Nehemiah is coming to the king and he says, King, we've got to do something because of all that's going. I am so concerned today about where our nation is headed that we need to do something about it, church, amen? Well, we're just going to, we're going to let us see if it's going to work its way itself out. Not going to happen until the church gets involved, until God's people start doing what God would have us to do. Then we will see revival break out. Then we will see a nation that turns back to God. But until the church stands up and becomes the church, we're going to see the power of the devil to destroy us. And let me go on to the next uh, question that you need to consider in order to find purpose in your life is do you see what God can, do you see what can and should be done? Has God given you a vision? Where there is no vision, the Bible says, the people perish. So have we lost the vision? Have we lost the true vision of the church? What is the purpose of the church? Why did God save you? Have we lost that vision? God saved you to use you to bring other people to salvation. And when we start serving Him and we have that vision, then we can see, and Nehemiah is looking, he's beginning to see that what needs to be done, I know that God has given me this insight, this vision, and what needs to be done is we need to fortify the city, we need to protect the city, We need to do what it takes in order to accomplish it. And this is what he begins to do. So do you see what can and should be done? And number uh, number six in this area of questions that you need to consider, am I seeking God? Nehemiah is seeking God. Nehemiah is praying to God. You look there, (coughs) you look there at verse four. Then the king said unto me, for what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. You, you know, people listen to me. You can pray with your eyes open. Did you know that? You can pray on the spot. When somebody asks you a question, before you answer, you ought to pray. Here's the king asking Nehemiah a question and talking to Nehemiah, and, and, and we get this concept of, so I prayed to the God of heaven. What is Nehemiah praying for? God, give me the words to speak properly that will honor and glorify you. Whew. Step back. Realize 
that Nehemiah, and, and I want to ca- uh, cover a couple things about Nehemiah and how Nehemiah is a great example for us. He is such an example that we need to look at and we need to begin to say, well, Nehemiah is, is, is a person who is looking at it in an ultimate way and he's beginning to see what needs to be done and he starts doing it. Now, this is where the vision comes in. If, you're, if, you, if you've asked God to forgive you and you ask God to save you, salvation comes into your life. You're a new person. God is leading you into path and be careful because when God's leading you, you're going to see as in Nehemiah's case, you're going to see individuals who come and try to derail you. So what is it? What are the examples of Nehemiah? One of the first things we realize is the counting of the cost. And I kind of alluded to that is when you begin to see a God vision, when you begin to be hear from God, the message of God, what God's purpose is or what he has given you to do, you need to sit down yourself alone with God and begin to say, God, reveal to me how this will be accomplished. What is it that I'm going to need? You begin to count the cost. How foolish it is for you to uh, you know, start a project, and this is what happens in the churches. We start a project, we work the project for a short period of time, and then we abandon the project as if God was not in it. Now, people, let me say something. If God was in it at the beginning, God's still in it. He doesn't doesn't change his mind. God has always been in the process of bringing people to a relationship with him. From the Old Testament throughout the New Testament. God is reaching individuals. And so we need to count the cost. We need to say, okay, this is what it's going to take. This is how I'm going to do it. This is what I'm going to ask for. And this is the concept of where I really count the cost. Don't become a Christian unless you're willing to count the cost. You know what it means? It means denying yourself. That's the cost. Give up yourself and surrender to Jesus Christ. So you count your cost as we see in verses 7 and 8 of chapter uh, chapter 2. He says, Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given to me. See, he's counting the cost. He says, okay. He's already worked this out. He's already prayed and said, God, give me the right words to say to this king. So he says there in verse 7, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. Now what he's saying is, king, there's people on the other side that don't want Jerusalem to arise, to be anything. They want to keep Jerusalem, they want to keep the church in check. They want to keep the church broken down. Sound familiar? They want to keep the church in such a way that we no longer can gather. Okay? And, and when this concept is, he's beginning to say, this is what I need. Give me these letters. In verse 8, and a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest. Now here's the cost. He says, you know, in order for me to build the gates, in order for me to build the city, I'm going to need some things. Now, Nehemiah is probably saying, I can't afford it. But people listen to me, God can afford it. When we look at ourselves, we have the inability. But when we look to God, He has the ability. So Nehemiah is saying, he's he's coming here and he says, You know, give me the the letter unto Asa, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make the beam for the gates of the palace, which attain it to the house and for the wall and the city and, and so forth, as he begins to identify here. He says, Lord, you know, there's a cost here. And he's asking for the cost. And the the second aspect of Nehemiah is we see his act of stepping out in faith. Because he begins to identify and he begins to to attest that it's going to be a separation from him and the king. You don't get the job done until you step out in faith. There is a need to step out in faith. Now, faith is not being ignorant. Faith is taking and relying upon something greater than yourself. Okay? When we begin to realize this concept of taking that step of faith, we are not stepping out into nothing. We are stepping out into the hands of God. And when you step out into the hands of God, God, listen, God is going to hold you up. God will not let you fail if it's God's plan in the first place. So Nehemiah, he steps out in faith, and we need to realize as we don't know tomorrow, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but guess who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? 
God does. God knows. And when you go into this process of knowing that God knows tomorrow and God has influenced you to serve Him, to step out in faith, you step out in faith knowing that God's got it anyway. God's, God's got this. Now, the evaluation of the situation, you need to evaluate that situation very truthfully. That is where we get into the next point. You need to evaluate the situation truthfully. Sometimes, some uh, way, we, we get ourselves involved in here. And what uh, Nehemiah does is he, he began... Now, Nehemiah doesn't really call a committee together and say, Hey guys, we need to discuss this, 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 and this. I think sometimes churches, we have too many committees and it creates uh, problems. And so what Nehemiah does... Verse 11, he comes to Jerusalem, catch this, so I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Well, what did he do in the three days that he was there? It looks like he did nothing, but read on. You begin to see that what he did is he began to evaluate the situation truthfully. He didn't go to the people in town and say, hey, tell me what the problem is. You tell me the problem and I'm going to fix the problem for you. No, what Nehemiah does is he evaluates, he says, God, show me, God, reveal to me the things that need to be accomplished. And so he comes into the realm of verse 11 through 15. He arose in the night, what it says there in verse 12, and, and some few men with him that basically had brought, neither told any man what my, what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. You see, he's, he's still seeking God. He's not bringing man in because sometimes when you bring man in, everybody's got an opinion of something, don't we? But the only opinion that matters is not my opinion, but God's opinion. And Nehemiah is seeking God. And he's going around the city and he's evaluating truthfully. I wonder if he was taking notes. I wonder if he was jotting down things. He says, well, this wall here, this gate needs all this, this, this. This wall is only two foot high. We need to build it up this side. What was he? He was, listen, he was truthfully seeking God and he's evaluating the situation truthfully. Listen, if God reveals a plan to you, you need to evaluate it truthfully. You need to say, well, how, how can we accomplish? What do we need? And begin to allow God to speak. Once God has uh, made it clear to you, once you've evaluated the situation, you still come into the area of there still needs to be patience on your part. Oh, you don't want to hear that, do you? We are the most impatient people I know. I'm waiting for the amens. You think about it. Fast food. Do you get impatient waiting in line? Go ahead, uh-huh. Uh-huh. We do. It's supposed to be fast. Well, you go home and try to cook it yourself, it probably would take you longer to cook it and go home than it would be to go somewhere. Well, you, you get the picture. But we need to be patient. Verse 16. We find this. And the rulers knew not whether I went. For three days, nobody knows. He is being patient. He is waiting for God's time. Do you think sometimes we run ahead of God? Yeah. Nehemiah says, okay, Lord, I've got the letters from the king. I'm going to go there and I'm going to tell everybody what they need to do. No, he didn't do that. He goes there and he evaluates it and he's very patient he hasn't disclosed this to anybody but the few that had gone with him basically and when god's timing is right that's when you share god's plan share god's plan you be patient then you come to the point of sharing God's plan. You begin to, to educate people. You begin to tell people what God's plan is all about. You go into the area of, of looking here in chapter 2, verse 17. Then said I unto them, you see the distress that we are in. Hey, that's obvious. I mean, look around. What's the distress within the church today? I mean, it's obviously that we have more empty pews than we have full pews or seats or chairs. But share God's plan. 
So he says, it's, it lieth waste and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, he says, this is the invitation. He says, come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. This is sharing God's plan. We need to be where God would have us to be. We need to be doing what God would have us to do. The church will become powerful when we do what God would have us to do. And when we serve God, we are open to God. And then we also realize that the moment that you set out to serve God, you are going to face opposition. And you need to be prepared for opposition. Somebody's going to oppose you. Somebody's going to say, well, you'll never get it done. Read the book of Nehemiah and you're going to realize that there were individuals who were there that opposed him. You begin to see, and you see there in verse 10, we realize when Sanballat the Hornite, or some people as I was in college, the, the professor says, just call him the Hornet. You like Hornets? Most people don't, especially if you get stung by one. Last thing you want to do is get stung by one. But here is, we are introduced, when Sanballat the Hornite... Uh, uh, and Tobiah, the servant of Ammonite, heard of it. It grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Point number one, there's a problem. Opposition. One time. Begins. It doesn't stop. Do you think that Christians have smooth sailing the rest of their life? Get over that fault. The, de the devil is going to oppose you and he's going to do everything in his power. And he's not going to do it once. We know that through the temptation of Jesus Christ that Jesus was not only tempted once, he was tempted over and over and over again. And when we really, well, let, let, let's look here. Look at verse 19. But when Sanballat the Hornite, the Hornet, right, the Hornite, when Sanballat the Hornite and, and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, Geshem the, the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? You see, they began to bring opposition and they began to bring doubt into the minds of, of the ones who were following Nehemiah. Opposition, be prepared for opposition. But not only is it the process of us being prepared for opposition, we need to realize, and as you go through Nehemiah, you need to realize that sometimes the plans that you thought was going to work out so great needs to be altered a little bit. So be open to some change, okay? Be open to some change. Now, here's what was happening. Here's what we see. Here's what we know through reading Nehemiah. They was working on rebuilding the wall with one hand, but yet there was a sword in some of the hands, right? Now the sword was there to defeat, to ward off the enemy, the opposition to protect the ones who was working on the wall. And people, what it is showing us is somehow, some manner of form, we come together as we share God's plan, we work God's plan together because working together we can get more accomplished than we can working all by ourselves. I could just see Nehemiah going there from the king and say, King, you know, it's going to take me 15 years for me, for me to build this wall because I'm just a little bit older and I just don't hold out as long as a lot of these young people. And I just, you know, let me do it myself. That's not Nehemiah. Nehemiah says, I want you all involved. If we get involved, if we work together, we can get it accomplished. You work this gate, you work that gate, you work that gate, and all the gates will be accomplished, the walls will be done, but there is an enemy out there and somebody needs to hold the sword. Be open to change. He, he, he didn't anticipate the, the, I guess, the animosity of this. They tried to deter him. They tried to kill him. Read Nehemiah. They said, Nehemiah, you need to come to a meeting. Nehemiah says, no, I don't. I need to do God's work. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what it says. You need, he, 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 he needed to come out because they had a plot that they was going to kill him. And Nehemiah says, no, I got a, a, a job to do and God is with me here. You want me? You come down here. You see, you don't have to do what the enemy says. You got to do what God says. And so when we get this, we need to be open to change. And when we get to the concept of realizing this, we go into the next idea of how do you, how to find God's purpose in your life? How do you find God's purpose? I wish I knew. 
is what many people say. Because if I knew what God's purpose was for me, I would do it. Oh, just, you know, I'll do anything. That, just tell me what, what, what I need. People listen to me. God has spoken loud enough and long enough, and yet we're still trying to figure out what it is that God is wanting us to do. So how do we find God's purpose? And I'm going to tell you, it begins, and this is what we really don't want to do, is it begins and it starts with a, re a relationship with God. It starts with that personal relationship with God. You've got to have a personal relationship with God. If you don't have have a personal relationship with God, you can forget about living out God's purpose. God has a purpose for you, something you can do, something that, that nobody else can do the way that you can do. And if you would start working what God has given you and you would start living for God, you would see great things accomplished, but it needs to start with a relationship with God. God, I am here. God, I am a sinner. We all are sinners. And God, I trust you. And God, I give myself to you. And God, God, work in me. That's where it starts. It starts with a relationship with God. But how do we go on from there? I've been a Christian for years, so how do we go on from there? How do I know God's purpose? How do I uh, stay in that situation? Is we need to find ways. The second thing is you've got to find ways to listen to God. You're listening to something, unless you're deaf. Right? So how do we find ways to listen to God? I mean, we're, we're living in a culture today that is still just so, you know, 1950s. We never done it like that, so we don't like the new change that's happening within the area of how God is speaking to some of the individuals. Well, people, let me tell you something. God doesn't speak just one way to people. God speaks multi-ways to people. God speaks not only one language, but God speaks a multitude of languages. You've got to find a way to listen to God. If it's Christian music, listen to God. If it's somebody speaking, listen to God. If it's contemporary music, listen to God. If it's hymnal out of the hymnal, listen to God. Because it's not in the mannerism, but it is in the words that is there that is supposed to turn us to God. And when we're nitpicking and griping and complaining about it, you're not listening to God. Do you know you really can't complain and listen at the same time? Because your mind's already like, you know. Like old Charlie Brown, you know, when the adults would talk to Charlie Brown, what did Charlie Brown hear? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, wah, wah, yeah. And we're like, well, you know, I didn't understand. Well, he didn't either. And that's where we are in our culture today. We're wanting to find God's purpose, but we're not listening to God. People listen to me. God doesn't even have to speak a word and He's speaking. Did you know that? Through the winds? Through the environment? We see the power of God. Go to Nicodemus. God, Jesus says to Nicodemus, you know the winds, do you know where the winds come from? Where are they going? You see, God, God is God. Why are, why are we... Why do we think we're so powerful that we take and we cram God into our little box and say, this is what God's like? But we're doing that. Oh, you can't listen to God. We've got to find ways to listen to God. Next point. Be committed to do all things. Now this comes into where you are right now. Be committed to do all things to God's glory. Now I want to look at, at the, the last verse of chapter 2, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 20. I'm going, to read, I'm going to give you my translation. God will prosper us, we will build. Now, let's read what it says here. Then answered I them, now this is to the opposition, then answered I them and said unto them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us, Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion, nor right, nor mem memorial in Jerusalem. He says, you know, you done, you done threw God away. 
A lot of people, a lot of your friends throw God away. They don't want nothing to do with God. But people, let me say this. If we would start living for God, our lives would start to be a radiant light to them and they would see what God is doing in us and for us and then their lives can be changed. It is possible for you to go through life and never accomplish what God knows you can do. Did you know that? You can live this whole life. A lot of people go through whole, their whole life and never find the purpose that God has for them. Things in this world can keep you in bondage, the chains, and they can last for a long, long time. And the last thing that the devil wants you to do is to use your talents for God's glory. So let me ask you something. Who are you bringing glory to? Truth is, you're bringing glory to somebody, aren't you? Either you're bringing glory to God or you're bringing glory to yourself and the devil. If you're not for God, you're against God. So, life's true purpose. God has been using you and using you and He gives you that purpose. Life's true purpose it always begins with God. Now, the reason you're not fulfilling God's purpose is maybe you've never started it in God. And God is giving you an opportunity like He gives all of us to start afresh, to be saved, to be born again, to come to Him as our Savior, to realize what He has done. Are you willing to make that commitment to begin with God? It's very simple. God, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I need salvation. God, here am I. Use me to fulfill your purpose. God will do that. It's just you giving your life to Him. Let's pray. Father, help us to realize what you ask for is for us as individuals. We're not perfect. We're sinners. We deserve death. But yet you choose us. You choose to give us life. Life everlasting. You choose to be with us every step of the day. And so it is my prayer that we come to you and we realize the greatness of thy awesome power. And today, the altar is open for us to come and pray for us as individuals, for us as a nation. But it is for us to do something and to step out in faith. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen.